Hello, everyone, and welcome to History Day at DCDC. I'm Argola Rublek, the Academic Librarian for the History Collections at Senate House Library, and I'm the co-organizer of History Day alongside my colleague Kate Wilcox, Reader Experience Manager at the Institute of Historical Research Library. Thank you for joining us for this afternoon of special events, which brings together, which brings History Day to the Discovering Collections, Discovering Communities Conference for the very first time. For those of you who have not heard of us yet, History Day was founded in 2014 to bring together students, researchers, and anyone with an interest in history with professionals from archives, libraries, and other organizations with history collections from across the UK. It is a free annual event created collaboratively between the Institute of Historical Research and Senate House Library. And we would like to thank the organizer of the DCDC conference for kindly hosting us this afternoon and for all their work for making this event possible. Hello, um, everybody, and, and uh, uh, welcome um, to um, this afternoon session. Um, I really um, am delighted to be uh, chairing it. I think um, I'm here more because of my job title uh, than uh, my knowledge of the subject, but I'm utterly delighted to be here, and it's great to um, be taking History Day um, into, uh, into a new form, absolutely. Um, so, um, and History Day is all about putting, as Argila said, is all about putting researchers in touch with uh, collection professionals. Um, we have five speakers with two presentations um, this afternoon. Um, each set of speakers um, ha have been asked to uh, restrict their remarks to just 10 minutes to um, allow plenty of time for uh, questions and answers, which is the heart of History Day uh, in many senses. So please don't hesitate um, to ask uh, lots and lots of questions using the uh, Q&A function uh, in Zoom, which there's lots of instructions popping up in chat on how to do that. But um, even I can figure it out. So uh, uh, it, it is very simple. There's a QA and a uh, symbol at the bottom of your screen. Um, so uh, without any further introduction, um, I will uh, hand over in a moment to um, three uh, speakers linked to uh, the Royal Society and the Lisa Jardine grant scheme. Uh, so we have Ginny Mills from the Royal Society Library, um, Aaron Hanlon from Colby College in Maine, and Pamela McKenzie, who is uh, currently at the Max Planck Institute for the History of Science in Berlin. Um, and together they'll talk about uh, the Lisa Jardine uh, grant scheme. Thank you very much. Hi everyone, and um, thanks to Richard for the introduction and um, for allowing me to be part of the uh, History Day panel. Um, it's a pleasure to be part of this uh, virtual event. Um, so yeah, as Richard said, um, I'm Virginia Mills and I'm the Early Collections Archivist at the Royal Society. Um, so for those who don't know, the Royal Society is the UK's National Academy for Sciences, established in 1660. So it's one of the oldest learned societies in the world. And we have collections going right back to the foundation of the society and beyond. Um, so my main responsibility as archivist is obviously the, the care of, of the society's um, pre-20th century records. Um, but today I'm, I'm not here to speak about the content of the collections, um, which is what I'm normally doing, and they are great. So if you have an interest in history of science, you should definitely come visit us at some point when we uh, reopen. Um, but as the theme of the panel today and of the DC, DC conference is collaboration and connecting researchers with collections, um, I wanted to tell you about one way that we try to facilitate that at the Royal Society, and that is through um, the Lisa Jardine grant scheme which is administered by the Royal Society Library and Archive team. Um, so the scheme was established in 2018 to fund travel for access to primary materials for early career um, interdisciplinary research. Um, it's uh, very, very generously funded by donations from uh, Professor Lisa Jardine's family, friends and colleagues, and it's been set up in commemoration for her passion for history, collaboration and interdisciplinary studies um, after she sadly passed away in, in 2015. So many amongst you are probably familiar with Professor Jardine and her work. Um, she was a long time valued collaborator for the Royal Society collections, uh, particularly in her, her work on one of our most important fellows, um, early fellows, uh, Robert Hooke. Um, not only did she write extensively on history of science and make use of the Royal Society collections, enriching our understanding of them and helping us bring them to a wider audience. 
She also spearheaded efforts to purchase a valuable 17th century manuscript for the society collections, uh, the Hook Folio, and went on to help make a digital edition available through the Centre for Editing Lives and Letters. Um, and she was given the very rare honour as a non-scientist of becoming an honorary fellow of the society. Um, so the grant is set up in her name to kind of continue the spirit of collaboration and access to knowledge, which she was a real champion of. I just can't get my slides to change for some reason. <laughs> oh, there we go. Um, so I'm going to give you a very quick overview of um, what, who and what the, the scheme will fund and then say something briefly about why the society um, thinks that a scheme like this is beneficial for the organisation. And then I will hand over to uh, two past recipients of the award um, Aaron and Pamela to tell you about their perspective. Um, so the scheme is for those pursuing interdisciplinary research combining the arts or humanities with natural sciences. It will fund travel and subsistence costs for UK based researchers to make international research trips up to one month. Um, so that could be to use archive resources or to attend a conference or training events. Um, and we'll also fund longer research trips for those coming to the Royal Society collections um, that can be for a period of one to three months. Um, and they can include kind of visiting other collections as well uh, as part of that. Um, the grant is for early career researchers, which we class as anyone who is a doctoral candidate at least one year into their thesis or um, researchers holding a PhD awarded within the last 10 years. Um, so well, I'm an archivist by training, uh, not a grant scheme manager. So um, it's been a steep learning curve for me, <laughs> um, taking on kind of the management of a grant. But um, I'm, you know, of the belief <laughs> through this learning experience that the greatest benefit of the resources that we've been trusted to distribute as part of this grant um, can be realised by making the grant what be mutually beneficial for the researchers it's supporting and for the collections that they're visiting. So one of the key aims of the grant is to support the history of science community by stimulating and facilitating use of archive material and providing an additional source of funds for those in early career positions to get access to those materials um, and to the connections that they need. And, you know, the Royal Society wants to be part of furthering exciting and novel research. Um, in this area. Um, but we also have very rich historical collections of our own at the society, and we want researchers to make use of them. So <laughs> I'm going to be honest in saying that part of the motivation for the society to put time and resources into the grant is that we recognise we're also getting some really valuable benefits back from uh, researchers as well as supporting them in, in their work. So. You can see hopefully on this slide um, some of the diverse topics of research that have been funded by the grant um, currently and in the past. Um, so they focus on a kind of broad range of subjects from specific fellows of the Royal Society and the role of the society and its networks um, across many different branches of science. We've got botany and meteorology uh, topics in the past, uh, as well as science policy um, but also you know death studies looking at the science of music um, the intersection of science and the visual arts and um, one of our upcoming researchers will be looking at a rural studies which I'm quite jealous of she'll be going to Norway um, uh, so yeah the diversity of the researchers that an interdisciplinary grant such as this brings to the Royal Society um, is one of the major benefits for us. Um, as an organisation with records of over 350 years of research in all disciplines of science and natural philosophy, there's a vast range of subjects covered in our collections. Um, and the library and archive is managed by a small team of information professionals. And though we get to know our collections very well, we're not by and large subject specialists and certainly not over all the subjects covered in the collection. Um, so the Lisa Jardine grant helps us to bring researchers into the collection with subject speci specialist knowledge um, that enriches the collection and our understanding of it. And I'm sure I'm preaching to the converted on this, but I think it's worth saying. <laughs> 
Um, so the researchers that have been coming in are often doing in-depth research into individual records and objects that the staff simply wouldn't have time for. Um, they're bringing new perspectives to our collection from different disciplines and applying different methodolo methodologies. Um, so for example, the research that we had in looking at uh, John Evelyn was from a legal background and was considering the importance of his um, early modern writings on current environmental law. Um, we've had research into hearing loss, which was carried out by um, a practicing sign language translator and teacher. And she brought that knowledge and insight to her study of the pedagogies of those working with the deaf in the early modern period, which is really interesting. Um, and of course, these diverse expertise, you know, are shared with collection staff and very importantly, to a wider audience through publication and by feeding back into our finding aids. So yeah, um, by supporting these researchers financially to travel, to use the Royal Society collections, we're getting a wider range of researchers um, and more from more diverse organisations, more people come, are coming in from outside of London and outside of the UK who may not otherwise have been able to access the collections um, and often for whose research digital access is not um, best suited or not possible. Um, and again, this increased kind of geographical reach is bringing in new perspectives to the collection and also builds our network with academics and researchers in other cultural institutions, which is a really important aim for us uh, in the grant. Um, so, yeah, whilst it might be less of, we will also fund um, people to go to collections other than the Royal Society. <laughs> Um, so it might be a sort of less obvious or immediate benefit to the society for doing that. Um, but as I said, we're, we're keen to be part of um, stimulating research in the wider history of science community and broadening our, our networks and the possibilities for future collaborations. Um, so, yeah, um, finally, just um, sort of a, a note about the decision making process for the award. Um, it's um, the applications are assessed by an independent panel of academics chaired by a fellow of the Royal Society and they're all approved by our library committee. So I feel like I've gone on a lot about what enormous benefits the researchers could bring to the Royal Society, but that is not the kind of uh, main motivation in, in decision making. Funding is awarded first and foremost on the merits of the proposed research and the justification of the need to travel. Um, but we do ask people to kind of outline what the benefits will be to themselves as well as the organisations that they're intending to visit. And we will take that into account. Um, so hopefully there are some potential future applicants among you today who I might see at the Royal Society in the future or um, help facilitate your travel elsewhere. Um, if anyone is interested, the grant is currently open for applications until the 22nd of September. Um, and that is for research to take place in 2022. And there'll be further rounds of the grant, two rounds of the grant in 2022, if you want to apply for research later than that. Um, and I'm now going to hand you over to two past recipients of the Lisa Jardine grants who have kindly agreed to tell you something about their experience and the research that they carried out. Um, so firstly, I will hand over to Aaron Hanlon and then we'll hear from Pamela. I'm just going to stop sharing my screen. Okay, Aaron. Okay. Thank you, Jenny, and thanks everyone for um, everyone who organized for, for putting this together. I hope everybody can hear me and see the screen okay. Um, I just have two slides. Uh, the first one uh, just is about the, the background of the research that brought me to the Royal Society Library. I'm, I've been interested in the um, point at which the term data entered the English language in the 17th century and what sorts of things it described um, and what particularly what sorts of uh, forms of evidence it described when used that way. And so I started looking at uh, scientific instruments in particular navigational instruments like the octant or the sextant as you can see in the photo there. 
um, that produced a lot of numerical data. So that's what brought me there. Um, I'll say a bit about my experience and um, some of the what I think are the benefits of, of uh, the Lisa Jardine grant scheme. Um, for one, I was in a, a kind of complicated situation because I'm based in the United States ordinarily and I work on early modern Britain. So I, I find myself with reason to be here often for archival research, but I was also on sabbatical that year as a visiting scholar in history and philosophy of science at, at Cambridge. Um, and so the Royal Society was very helpful in kind of working with me on the funding part of the proposal and the, um, you know, what, what sorts of expenses would fall within um, the scheme, uh, given that I kind of needed to get to London, but it would be, have been expensive to kind of actually stay there. Um, so that was really helpful and I appreciate the, the eligibility for international scholars. Um, as Jenny said, they really do have fantastic manuscript collections, um, very well organized in my experience. You know, I could call up something like um, papers uh, of the Board of Longitude and they would be organized in such a way that I would encounter things that I didn't already know about and could easily kind of navigate the, the related materials. The, the archivists and the staff are extraordinarily helpful. Um, had a, a lovely experience there, I think, at least at one point when my uh, paleography skills failed me, somebody was helped me to able to help me figure out um, a squiggle or two. Um, I, the grant scheme does seem to encourage um, public facing work as well. So uh, I've listed here a couple of articles, one of which is is already out there, data at the dawn of the Anthropocene that, that um, arose from my research at the Royal Society. Um, the other one is more of a kind of peer reviewed um, piece that's forthcoming. Um, but uh, I think it, I, if, if I recall correctly, the grant scheme was very kind of encouraging about um, doing public facing work as part of as part of the research, which I thought was fantastic. Um, it, the only negative thing I could say about it is it's very cold, even for for a special collections reading room. So if you go there, if you're fortunate enough to go there, just bring a sweater. Um, and um, finally, I'll just say uh, that my work uh, at the Royal Society Library kind of inspired me to um, well, I recognize that because the staff were really great and the um, the reading room intimate and the materials excellent, that it would be a great place to bring my some of my undergraduate students uh, in the future. So when it's safe to do that, I'm really looking forward to um, bringing a group of students uh, over to to kind of introduce them to early modern history of science archives. And so that's what I have planned next. And I'll hand it over to Pamela. Um, okay, hi, I'm uh, Pamela McKenzie. I'm an art history um, PhD student right now at the University of British Columbia, still finishing my dissertation. Um, I'm also based uh, in the Max Planck group in Berlin, but it's actually not the history of science group. It's this group called Foray Laboratory that's technically based out of the KHI, the Kunsthistorisches Institute in Florence. Um, but yeah, I met a Max Planck group in, uh, in Berlin working on history of science topics. And so what you can see here on the screen right now is just a, a set of different images from um, Nehemiah Gru's uh, Anatomy of Plants. So this is a book made in the 17th century by a physician and a early microscopist named Nehemiah Gru. Um, and I'm interested in the representation of nature that kind of emerge from the use of new technologies. Um, and because Naomi Grew was a fellow at the Royal Society, um, this book was published through the Royal Society, so were several other books and many of his original manuscripts are there. Um, I spent my time at the Lisa Jardin, uh, with the Lisa Jardin grant sort of uh, going through all of his papers that are available there. And then sort of uh, looking also more broadly at other collections. There are a lot of original drawings from, um, for example, Marcello Malpighi and uh, Leeuwenhoek, the Dutch uh, microscopist Leeuwenhoek. And um, from uh, this time at the, uh, at the Royal Society, I, in addition to having done a lot of important work for my dissertation, which 
uh, will be finished soon. Um, I also have an article coming out soon in a special issue of the journal Nuncius that's about the relationship uh, between uh, Malpighi and Gru and their use of visual language. And the work I did at the Royal Society was super key for that, actually. Um, and in terms of sort of surprising things that happened, I mean, in addition to the archive, like this just being an excellent opportunity for me as a PhD student, again, like similarly based in North America with uh, without uh, great access to the primary documents I needed for my research. This was the only way I would have been able to spend such an intense amount of time in the archives. So uh, yeah, I, I'm super grateful for that. And also I wanted to reiterate uh, for the staff who were really, really helpful, um, really, really kind people who know the collections very well in my experience. Uh, I feel like Ginny was being very humble, but um, they're super, super helpful. Um, and uh, while I was at the Royal Society completing this research, I was also able to connect with the um, Making Visible group. There were some postdocs there that were digitizing um, all of the images from the collections. That was really exciting. Um, I've gotten to learn a lot from them. So there are also other scholars that are around that you may have an opportunity to meet if you go to the Royal Society, which is great. And then I have one more slide. Um, which is that um, while at the Royal Society doing this other research, I uh, came across what will be my next project, which is uh, working on visualizations of bladder stones in the Royal Society collections. This is something um, that seemed to come up a lot. A lot of scholars coming through sort of knew that they were there. There's this great scrapbook that's just got a lot of kind of um, images that hadn't previously been uh, uh, put in one specific place in the collection. And there's a, a series of really wonderful illustrations of bladder stones um, and they get presented when people are giving tours at the Royal Society often. Um, Keith, one of the archivists will be like, look at these strange stones. Um, what, what are those all about, right? Um, and I was, I wanna know what they're all about. Uh, where can I read more about this? And apparently not a lot of work has been done on them. And so I've developed that into a paper now and will be uh, turning it into a postdoctoral project. Hopefully to start next year, I'll be applying for funding for that. And so that was kind of a fun and unexpected um, consequence of just spending time in the archive was finding not just stuff for my current project but being able to develop a new project. So uh, that was really great and I will, uh, I'll finish up there for now, but um, looking forward to questions during the question period. Uh, if you want to know more about my experiences at the Royal Society, thanks. Marvelous stuff. I, I did not expect this session, this uh, part of the session, to end with bladder stones. Wonderful stuff. Um, so um, I can see there are uh, questions coming in. Um, uh, we we will uh, will have an extended uh, Q and A session uh, at, uh, after um, both. Um, presentations um, but uh, good, good to see the enthusiasm uh, to get back in libraries uh, and to get grants that I can I can see evidence there um, so um, our uh, second presentation um, is uh, from Stephen Spencer of the Salvation Army International Heritage Center um, and Adam Miller who is a, a PhD student at, at the University of Leicester um, who are working together on an ESRC funded uh, doctoral award um, which um, is uh, very exciting. So I will hand over to them. Okay. Um, so I'm the director of the Salvation Army's International Heritage Centre, and we are the institutional repository for the records and publications and objects um, of the Salvation Army all over the world. I just hang up my first slide up. So here we go. Um, so we hold around 90 cubic meters of records, that's about 5,000 boxes, which relates to the work of the Salvation Army from its origins in the 1860s to the to its work um, in the present day. But what is the Salvation Army? I'll do a quick run through, very quick, of what the Salvation Army is, and then Adam will come in to speak about his specific research topic, and then we'll come back for a bit more about the nature of our collaboration. So the Salvation Army uh, is an independent Christian denomination which evolved out, out of Methodism. Uh, it was founded by William Booth and his wife Catherine in 1865 in London. 
Uh, it has a network over the country and over the world of churches, which are called CORE. Uh, it's also well known for its social work, which began in the 1880s sort of in, in earnest and now sits alongside the evangelical work that Salvation Army does. Um, uh, as of March this year, the Salvation Army is established in 132 countries around the world. Um, and its work in those countries, including the UK, is run out of an international headquarters, which is located in the city of London. And we hold records from that institution as well as the Salvation Army in the UK. And it's some of the records from the international headquarters that Adam has been using for his research. So Adam, do you want to say something about what you're doing? Yeah, thank you, Stephen. And thank you for inviting um, both Stephen and I. Uh, just checking, can you hear me okay? Absolutely. Okay, great. Okay, so um, yeah, as Stephen says, I'm uh, Adam Miller. I'm a PhD student working on the collaborative project with the Salvation Army's International Heritage Centre. Uh, so I'm based at the University of Leicester. And um, obviously, I've spent plenty of time in London with Stephen and uh, his colleagues, um, who have been fantastic. Um, my, so my thesis looks at the Salvation Army's imperial settlements and colonies in Australia since the publication of In Darkest England and the Way Out in 1890. So some people may know, may or may not know um, what this publication is, but essentially, uh, so this um, publication was likely ghostwritten by uh, William T. Stead, who was the editor for a short while of the um, Pall Mall uh, Gazette. And, uh, and this um, publication was an expression of General William Booth, who was the army's um, founder and first general. Um, so it's an expression of his uh, philosophy on the regeneration of Britain's urban poor. Uh, he was he proposed a tripartite social scheme through which des destitute Britons, um, um, destitute Britons, or the submerged tenth as he described them, so uh, Britain's poorest 10% of the population, and how they would move from uh, metropolitan shelters known as the city colony to the farm colony in rural Britain. Uh, and the major one of uh, these was um, in Hadley in Essex, and you'll see that on the next slide soon. Um, and uh, eventually they would be moved to um, overseas colonies, uh, which were regulated settlements across the British Empire. Um, so my thesis predominantly looks at the creation or failure to create these um, um, colonies across the British Empire. Um, so it looks it looks at like Australia, but I was supposed to also research in South Africa, but unfortunately due to the COVID pandemic, this uh, research trip was canceled in March, 2020, about six days before I was due to fly out, which is uh, always fun. Um, and initially my thesis was gonna look predominantly at colonies created solely for British migrants. Uh, but this, since uh, researching at the Heritage Center um, in London, but also the Heritage Center in Melbourne and other archives across um, Britain and Australia, um, it's grown to look further at the experiences of poor juvenile Australian boys, so-called uh, fallen women, uh, indigenous communities in Australia and former convicts and uh, how they experienced um, these colonies. Uh, over to you Stephen. Oh, just, just to describe this uh, slide actually, um, the first image is Canaan home at Riverview Farm, so that's in uh, Ipswich in um, Queensland. It's about an hour's drive away from uh, Brisbane for anyone who knows their Australian geography. And actually Perga Colony, which was established for uh, indigenous um, communities, was is about a half an hour drive away from Riverview. But as you can see, the land uh, at the two sites are quite different. Um, yeah, over to you, uh, Stephen. Brilliant, thank you, Adam. Um, so I thought it'd be interesting to say a bit about how we came to be doing this collaborative award with Adam. And the Heritage Centre has had connections with various academics and universities over the years. Probably the longest lasting one we've had is with Birkbeck at the University of London. And we've worked with academics before and we've occasionally talked about doing some sort of collaborative doctoral programme, but it's never quite got off the ground for whatever reason. Then back in 2011, um, Adam's supervisor, Claire Anderson at Leicester, was doing some research with us on penal colonies in the Andaman Islands, in the Indian Ocean, and the Salvation Army ran a settlement on the Andaman Islands. 
And as she was working in the archive, we were sort of discussing the other records that we had around the subject and kind of her research on the kind of international history of what she calls the Castle Archipelago. Um, and we kind of realised that we had, that the Salvation Army archives held enough records that hadn't really been approached in that way to at least do a PhD, if, if not more research, because there'd been research done on specific Salvation Army settlements like at Hadley in Essex or in Australia or particularly in India, but no one had tried to pull together a sort of international history of these settlements and what they were doing and how they were led to empire and so on. It took us another five years to actually get the application into the ESRC for the collaborative award. Luckily, we were successful and we, um, we recruited for uh, a student to come on board with the project and Adam was uh, obviously successful in that process. And you began your PhD in, it was 2018, wasn't it? The first academic year that you started working yeah. with us. So Adam's due to finish at the end of this year. So it's worth noting that it's been a decade since I first began discussing this idea for CDA with Claire. So, I mean, I, I guess other institutions have a different experience of these kind of awards, but it's been a, it's been a kind of long, it's been a long process um, in my, uh, in our experience. So there's a question as well around why, what do we as an archive get out of doing a collaborative doctoral program with the university? And a lot of this, uh, Virginia touched on in what, in what she was saying about the Lisa Chardin Awards, that, I mean, it's really good publicity. Like the best way that an archive can get publicity is if academics and students use the collection and they publish about it, they do conference papers, people know the archives there, and it kind of raises that awareness that a collection exists and we have those kind of records that can support this kind of research. But also it's a really good way um, of kind of directing academic research because as an archivist, I think we all know that we hold things in our collections that are really rich, with really strong research potential. But academics might not have used them, students might not use them, they might not relate specifically to someone's ongoing research. And the CDA is a really good way of collaborating with an academic or an institution to kind of tease out how you can use a collection that you know is very strong, but we don't understand like the research landscape it sits in. So that's what Claire could bring, bring to our records. And that's kind of, that's what's enriched this um, this project. I mean, and it also brings a lot of specialism into the collection that we don't have, that people know things about the British Empire, about penal colonies, about Australia, that, that we in the Heritage Centre don't have ourselves. And that's one of the real strengths of why we wanted to go into this collaboration. So now finally, it's back to Adam, who can say a bit about the experience of, uh, of the collaborative PhD. Thank you, Steve. So yeah, I, I, I think it's worth saying that um, at the start of uh, the collaboration, I think we were it was quite an ambitious kind of project put forward about what we were going to do uh, as part of the collaboration. And unfortunately, the COVID pandemic has kind of um, halted some of it, some aspects. Uh, but we have persevered. Um, so. Um, some of the things we decided to do as part of the collaboration is we established a seminar series on, called the Institutions of Empire. So this began to run in uh, May this year, um, and we had uh, Dr. Mandy Banton from uh, the School of Advanced Study at the University of London. Uh, she gave the first paper on um, the National Archives and discussed whether we can conceive of the National Ar Archives of as an institution of empire and uh, we had a second event that was on uh, oil and empire and then uh, one of the events was going to be on the salvation army and unfortunately due to the um, ucu global uh, boycott of um, the university of leicester we have put the seminar series on hold for well probably until the autumn so that's a plug just so you all know that's coming back in the autumn if everyone wants to uh, if anyone wants to uh, attend any of the events um, another thing we did was we did some site visits. So me, Stephen and Claire uh, Anderson, um, who was the first supervisor on the project, all went to Hadley Farm, which you can see uh, just in the background there. And obviously you can see the Thames estuary just kind of in the uh, far, uh, far ground. Um, 
Uh, yeah, so this used to be part of the Hadley site. I think now it's kind of um, free land. Stephen might want to correct me there. But uh, the the um, Rare Breeds Farm, which is still um, still owned by the Savage Army, is slightly to our left, uh, which is out of the screen, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, we did the site visit, which was um, really interesting, but also just really important to get a, a feel and uh, an understanding of just how big the... Um, initial Hadley colony was, which was the initial farm colony, which is the second um, kind of stage of uh, William Booth's um, tripartite uh, social scheme. Um, one of the things we're also going to do is write a co-authored article. This is going to be, we think, on um, Salvation Army's contribution to the international temperance movement. Um, and so some of my work are on the Salvation Army's um, colony um, that was set up called Perga in the previous slide with uh, indigenous communities. Uh, some of the work I've done on, on that is going to go into that article because they do a lot of work in trying to uh, stop indigenous communities engaging with so-called urban vices, um, such as alcohol. Um, one of the things that is almost complete is a subject guide on the Salvation Army's colonies. And this isn't going to be restricted to Australia. This is going to kind of give uh, potential researchers information about Salvation Army's colonies across the British Empire um, but also in Britain as well um, and we did have an internship uh, planned where I was going to spend I think a month in the uh, Heritage Centre learning the um, the trade basically of, of being a you know not, not being an archivist per se but working within an archive and one of the great things about being part of this collaboration is that Every time I have visited the Heritage Centre, I've basically been treated as a staff member. So I've been able to go and sit in the offices, uh, have access to all, all the files that I required, um, which is an experience that I've, I've never had before, just going and like, getting your own files and being able to explore the, the um, collections without any restriction whatsoever. So that was, uh, that's was that been a kind of quite an incredible experience. And I think uh, the last thing I'll say is one of the great things about these collaborations is they there is a kind of, uh, mutual benefit to it so uh, for, for obvious reasons it's, a, it's been a huge benefit to me with the access to the um, to the archives kind of unfettered access uh, but also uh, for, for Stephen and his colleagues uh, in the sense that I've had people um, kind of approach me about um, offering uh, documentation um, to the Heritage Centre since so there was um, when I first started my PhD, somebody overheard me talking about my research and they offered um, their grandfather's or great grandfather's diary to me, who was a uh, migration officer in um, Australia, um, which is incredibly uh, uh, fortunate. Um, and yeah, I've, I've, I've had access to his diary for a while. And also someone has um, some files on uh, the Salvation Army in Kenya, which uh, I believe they're going to pass to us too. So it's been, they're, they're kind of um, definitely fortuitous um, moments of the collaboration and, and things you kind of don't really expect to come out of it, but they have. And I guess that's one of the beautiful things about doing this collaboration. But also, you know, the the relationship with uh, Stephen and, and his colleagues has been excellent as well. And I've, I've really enjoyed that element of the project. I will hand back to Richard now, I think. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, can I invite all, all of all of the panelists to, to reactivate their cameras and, and come back um, uh, so that our attendees can see you all? Um, I think I, I, um, there's, there is so much uh, collaboration um, to be <laughs> celebrated in what's been said um, in the last half hour. Um, it's, it's extraordinary. And we do have, there are some, um, there are some sort of very uh, specific questions uh, coming in about um, uh, uh, particularly arrangements around uh, Lisa Jardine um, grants and, and the reopening of the Royal Society Library, which perhaps for January it might be best if you, if you um, answer um, directly. Um, I think, I mean, I think one thing I would highlight before I start reading out something, well, I'll read out one of the uh, questions here, and that is, um, it's a really interesting question about how the uh, Royal Society uh, uses the outcomes, uh, how you incorporate the research produced by early career academics 
on the grant scheme into your finding aids and does this go somewhere into the catalog um i think that's actually that that's that's a question that could usefully be put to all of us and on which every librarian should and archivist uh, should be reflecting and i know adam you you touched on a on a subject guide but i mean i i um I've certainly had the experience of seeing in, in, in our reading room at Senate House a, a reader sitting with a, a box that we've catalogued as unidentified objects. And, and only after they'd been looking at them for two weeks did, did any of us actually think to say, I'm sorry, do you know what they are? Because we, we, we've had them for 60 years and we, we don't know what they are. And they did and, and could write it down very quickly. Um, but um, I, I, I just wonder if anybody, any of you wanted to talk about that, that uh, the way these kind of collaborations can have that very direct improvement on, on the library service or the archive service for our readers. Um, I can, yeah, I can <laughs> say something. Um, yeah, um, absolutely. We try and make sure we're having these conversations with people whilst they're in the reading room. That's a really important part of the process. Um, and yeah, add information to our descriptive information in catalogues and on our picture library um, we can often as you said we can give information about things that may have been unidentified before mm. um, so yeah people bringing in their kind of thematic knowledge and knowledge from other material that's in other collections and they can say this looks really similar to this um, so we, we like to highlight um, in our catalogue where there's related material elsewhere as well and if there have been things published about it, we will quite often try and put in a reference to published material where people can find out more uh, about specific objects. Yeah, I mean, I completely agree with all of that in terms of how reliant the archivist is on the kind of the subject specialist. Mm. Because as an archivist, you, you know your collection, you understand things about the material they're produced on and kind of the institutional background, things that are created. But particularly for us, where we hold a kind of in-house collection that's the way for number created organically itself, we have very little about kind of the wider world around that, the kind of the non-publicity version of what was going on. So that's that's really useful. I mean, having Adam bring in a lot of knowledge and having a PhD student who has the scope to do the research that we don't have the scope to do, to kind of inform questions that we know we don't know the answers to. And what I like about being an archivist, which I don't envy academics for, is that you don't need to have a thesis as an, as an archivist. You just you catalogue the material, and the catalogue's never finished. It's always just, this is what we know so far about the collection. And when you get to the point where you don't quite know what things are, you just stop and say, you know, unknown objects or miscellaneous items. You don't need to have that kind of academic rigour to actually get to, get to the bottom of stuff. That's what you hand over to the academic for. Yeah. I can also just come in quickly and just say, yeah, I mean, I think one of the things me and Stephen experienced when doing the project is I was doing kind of a lot of uh, survey work when I first started because we had I hadn't chosen my case studies. And so that allowed me to kind of get into um, the archive and get into the nitty gritty of what what um, colonies and uh, settlements the Salvation Army actually created. And I think me and Stephen were both quite surprised that the just just the, the mass number of uh, settlements the Salvation Army had created across the British Empire that I guess we probably would never have uncovered had I we not really done this project. Um, so that, that's been kind of quite interesting for us. Um, and I do I do actually I there's a there's a very direct question here about uh, the experience of collaborative doctoral awards in particular, but I, I think it probably applies to all, all these kind of funded uh, research experiences of uh, uh, someone due to start a collaborative doctoral award with English Heritage in October, looking at the mahogany um, in their care. Um, do, does anyone have any advice for how to make a success of these collaborations, especially in the face of setbacks, COVID related or otherwise. Well, I, I think we could all talk uh, for the rest of the afternoon about research setbacks. Um, but uh, do, does anybody have, have it, it, those of you who've, who've received these awards and, and been doing the research, do you have, uh, do you have tips on, on how to make a success of that relationship with the archive? Maybe we're just really easy to get along with as as collections people. Maybe. Yeah. 
<laughs> then again, if that's okay. Um, I think the one thing I would say is um, be as flexible as possible and try and cultivate a good relationship with your collaborative partner and hope that they will also be as flexible as possible because things change within, well, I mean, especially in the UK recently, things change within the week, never mind, um, you know, the year. So you've kind of got to be open to the idea that, you know, whatever you are doing is going to change within the blink of an eye. And uh, credit to Stephen, he's been absolutely brilliant at being as flexible as possible despite everything going on. Um, and yeah, it, it's been it's been a pleasure working with him during this time because, you know, I, I, I know from other people's experiences it hasn't been quite as easy and they've they've really struggled with the collaborative element during that um, during the pandemic because they don't they've never really created a good relationship with their collaborative partners. That's very kind. Thank you, Adam. I think it helps that Adam had been with us for what two years, eighteen months before the pandemic. So we kind of we knew each other by that point. Whereas it'd be a lot harder, I think, to start a CDA now where you're kind of doing it on Zoom or whatever, kind of initially. So I mean, Aaron and and, and Pamela, did you just feel like sort of? slightly enriched uh, researchers amongst a body of, of researchers in a reading room, um, albeit a chilly one? Um, or or it, did, did you feel that, you you know, you, you had a very different status there and you had personal relationships with the staff and so forth? I, I mean, so I'm trying to think when I was... Um, when I was uh, there, there were quite a few people coming in and out. Um, I didn't, I don't, and partly is the way people work uh, and partly, you know, my general kind of shyness, but so I didn't really strike up kind of a, a, a relationship with other researchers there, but I found I, you know, I did with uh, the archivists and, and, the, and the staff. And so I think the only, the thing I would say on this question it's kind of the other side of what Stephen and Jenny have um, have uh, articulated. Um, that the archivists know the collections in a way that, as uh, researchers, we don't necessarily. So I had I, I went in with a lot of kind of background knowledge on what I was looking at, um, but I didn't know just that of the existence of many um, of many things in the collection. And for that, I relied on basically also picking up on what Adam said, that flexibility to kind of say, okay, I went in with this plan, but actually this thing is really cool and I didn't know about it. And I only found out about it because the archivist kind of pushed me in that direction a little bit. And then it became, you know, something, you know, something that was really beneficial um, to the project. Um, maybe I can say something very briefly as well from, um, that uh, we do ha um, host collaborative doctoral awards at the Royal Society as well. And th so the Lisa Jardine grants are kind of um, obviously much shorter term kind of placements than that. But um, they are sort of one of the hopes is that they do allow researchers to spend a bit longer with us than they might otherwise have been able to. So it's sort of supporting their living costs if they're going to be staying in London for a while. So hopefully it does give us a little bit more time to develop um, a relationship with someone and maybe help them develop their, their research in those unexpected directions. Mm -hmm. And sorry, Pamela, were you about to speak? I can. Um, yeah. Uh, I um, I found that the experience at the Royal Society was um, both really like, like there was like a lot of this sort of like professional and research based activities that happened there. But on the other hand, uh, to your question, I did feel like I was a part of a community of scholars that were there, like both when there were people visiting on a day that I would be there, I would be told about it a week or two in advance and often invited out for lunch and things like this. So I don't wanna like rub in pre COVID sort of, uh, I don't know, archive etiquette, but like it was, it was before COVID. And so there were a lot of opportunities actually to, to meet people and people I've since worked with actually. So I, I found that to be a, one of the most enriching parts of being there was kind of entering into a very eager and willing community of scholars and the fact that the uh, librarians, the archivists uh, thought about me, you know, 
uh, and let me know when there might be someone coming that uh, would be of interest. So I thought that was uh, really lovely. Um, so I have said there are a couple of uh, there are a couple of uh, specific questions. So um, Adam, um, uh, uh, about your research project, ha have you consulted or used uh, any post-colonial literature uh, to contextualize your findings? Um, and if so, or not, uh, do you have a key recommended reference that has helped your understanding? Yeah, yeah, sure, uh, absolutely. In fact, uh, as part of the um, ESRC award, I had to do a, um, a second master's degree. So I did an MSc and part of that, we looked at the philosophy of social science. And in, within that, we looked at the post-colonial, uh, decolonial uh, literature. So, I mean, um, Homi Baba, uh, Paul Gilroy, Devesh Chakrabarti, um, Gayatri uh, Spivak, uh, Candace of Speak. Uh, literature like that I've used quite a lot. I mean, um, it's not necessarily gone in the thesis as much as maybe it should do yet, um, but it has been used to, um, to contextualize my work for sure. Um, I've, I, I use a lot of um, new imperial history, which has kind of grown out of um, post-colonial uh, literature. Um, and so some of that work, including my own supervisor, Claire Anderson's work, um, but also stuff like Antoinette Burson. Um, um, yeah, so I, there's, there's a lot of that literature that I've used, but also, I mean, if you want specific recommendations, I can always send, um, I can put my um, email address in the chat and we can speak um, one on one That's about that. That's very generous. You should also be able to see the question, so you you can type an answer directly to it if you. But or, or yeah, um, I, I'm sure anybody Thank would uh, would be uh, would be very grateful. And um, so I I think th there's one more question, which I think is a challenge to to all of us, which I, we probably don't have time to discuss or answer. But I'm going to read it because it's a good point. Uh, is there going to be more outreach programs to raise awareness of these types of schemes, say at undergraduate level? Uh, and perhaps also an attempt to appeal to and reach marginalized history students so that when they come to undertaking doctoral research, they're already aware of what is out there. Um, we all do our level best uh, to communicate uh, these opportunities, but um, there is perhaps uh, a challenge there for us to, um, to, to be better at, at uh, collaborating. On a national professional level, I, I, I know that there are, uh, there are lists and, and, and um, there are uh, central bodies, but um, yeah, perhaps we could all be better um, about communicating what opportunities, particularly, I mean, my own library has a, has a research, a library research fellowship program that I think we could be better at communicating. Um, oh, and, and there's one very big question, which I think we're going to have to leave. Can anyone recommend an online resource for those of us just starting out on archival research methods um, on archival archival research, sorry, um, to uh, understand how to use archives. Um, I just jump in, sorry, Richard, and really yeah. quickly. Something. Things like Discovery at National Archives and the Archives Hub are absolutely amazing. So I think what we need to do is get students to, know, to understand archive collections before they choose their research topics. Yeah. Things like that, you don't need to go to the archives, just log on to Discovery at TNA, and it, will, it aggregates a lot of archive collections from across the UK. And I've like Portal Europe does the same thing for, for Europe. And I think that's, that's really important to get younger students kind of aware that what they can do with archives. Sorry. No, 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 please don't apologise. And the, the only other thing I would say is I've, I've, I've contributed to and listened to a lot of uh, sessions on how to use archives. And I promise you the first thing every archivist says is you don't need to understand how to use the archive before you come to the archive. Please just come to the archive and talk to us. And it, it isn't a mystery. Um, we're, we're not the Wizard of Oz behind a curtain. We're, 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 we're honestly doing our best to be approachable. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, it, it, any... any um, any uh, any uh, any guidance uh, you genuinely require, you should be able to get um, in any reading room uh, with, with a smile, if maybe not an invitation to lunch, but you know, sometimes. Um, so I, I'm sorry, I've allowed that uh, to sneak 
uh, over time, um, I need to uh, I, I need to hand back uh, to Argula just to round out the um, session. But I'm, I'm sorry that the Zoom means that we can't applaud you. Um, I, I would like to encourage everyone to give you a round of applause. Uh, thank you uh, very much indeed. It's been a very stimulating afternoon. Thank you. And thank you also from us again for all your really interesting and fantastic contributions and to Richard for chairing the session uh, so expertly as well. Um, we're just really here to give you a very quick end slide. Um, so this is just to let you know if you would like to know more about History Day, you're very welcome to, to use, um, or you can visit our website. Or you